What's up, everybody? Mr. Forrest back for the final episode of E3, Ed Encounters Ephesians. Guys, this has been amazing. Let's jump right into it. What a crazy, incredible, epic ride it had been through the book of Ephesians. God had taught him so much. God had challenged him in so many ways. God had changed him so much. Ed Johnson would never be the same again. What an incredible journey. And there Ed sat in Mrs. Kuvasier's literature class, listening to the sound of the rain hit the window. Now, sounds were weird for Ed. The soft, subtle sounds often seemed louder than the strong, deliberate sounds. For example, Ed could hardly hear Mrs. Kuvasier's voice, but the sound of the rain seemed so loud. The sound of Steve Kahara's pencil tapping the desk seemed so loud. The sound of Laura Kredelmeyer burping seemed so loud. The, the soft buzz of the fluorescent light seemed so loud. The sound of Joseph Lewis sliding his feet across the carpet seemed so loud until Ed couldn't take it anymore. He stood on top of his desk and he yelled, You don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. Mrs. Kuvasier said, Ed Johnson, sit down and listen to the lecture on Homer's Iliad this instant. Ed said, but I can't. The noises, the noises are too loud, she said. Then you'll go to the principal's office. And she grabbed Ed. And as she dragged him away to the principal's office, Ed lamented, Soylent Green is made of people. It's people. Ed probably went to the principal's office once a week, usually not for being bad, just for being Ed. For example, one time Ed made a spitwad shooter out of a mechanical pencil, some paper clips, and a jar of mayonnaise. One time Ed decided to style his eyebrows using a glue stick. One time Ed wore two juice boxes that were full instead of shoes, and everywhere he walked, he sloshed grape juice everywhere. So there he sat in the lobby of the principal's office waiting to see the principal, but this was a familiar sight. Ed was thinking as he sat there in the silence, appreciating the silence, about how much he had learned this past year from the book of Ephesians. He felt like just now he was starting to understand the Christian life. He was just now starting to understand what it meant to be in Christ and to live that way as a result. So one final time, Ed reached in his pocket and he opened the book of Ephesians, and he read the final main passage in the book of Ephesians, and it was a bittersweet feeling. It was like saying goodbye to an old friend. Let's take a look at what Ed read. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. This passage of scripture is talking about a war, a war that every single believer is entangled in right now, whether they realize it or not. And this war is an invisible war. It is a spiritual war. Ed had a pocket knife, but his pocket knife was not going to help him in this war. Ed had boxing gloves, but this is the kind of battle that won't be settled in the ring. This isn't the kind of battle that uses technology or big weapons like missiles or tanks. This is a spiritual battle, and to fight a spiritual battle, you need the right equipment. And Ed asked, But what is that equipment? What equipment do I need to fight a spiritual battle? And then Ed remembered what Mr. Klitzing had taught him. If you have a question about the text, read the context. And Ed read the context and he found six pieces of equipment that God has given every single believer to fight in this spiritual battle. This passage starts out by saying, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That means if you have like bulging biceps, that's not going to help you in this battle. If you have powerful pectorals, that's not going to help you in this battle. If you have tightened triceps, that's not going to help you in this battle. You need to be strong in God's strength. 
You see, Paul is reminding these believers in Ephesus, they used to worship Diana, and they used to depend on her to protect them. They used to use magic charms and say magic words, depending on those to protect them from spiritual forces. But Paul is reminding them, that's not who you are anymore. You are now in Christ. You need to rely on God's strength. Now look what the Bible says in verse 14. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Ed had one of those aha moments. He jumped up from his chair and he ran over to the receptionist and he high-fived the receptionist. And then he turned around and he high-fived the chair that he had been previously sitting in. And then he high-fived himself and then he bent down and he high-fived a stick of gum that was on the ground. He ran out to the hallway and he high-fived the school nurse as she walked by looking, wondering what this strange kid was doing. He was about to high-five the principal's pet goldfish when the receptionist stopped him. Ed was so excited because he saw something from the Bible that he had never noticed before. All through the book of Ephesians, we are told how to walk. Chapter 2 and verse 10 tells us to walk in good works. Chapter 4 and verse 1 tells us to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. Chapter 4, verse 17 says we can't walk the way we used to walk. Remember, a new sock, a new walk. Chapter 5 tells us to walk in love, to walk in light, to walk in wisdom. But here we find ourselves in chapter 6, and no longer are we being told how to walk anymore. We're being told how to stand. Paul already told believers to take off the old self and put on the new self. But in this passage of scripture, he's saying, put on the armor of God. And he starts talking about the armor of God with the belt of truth. A Roman soldier would wear a breech-like apron made of loose leather that the soldier would wear underneath his armor. And this leather would protect his thighs and his midsection, but also provide a place to tuck in his loose garments so he could move more freely during battle. And the Bible says that truth is our leather apron of protection. And then it talks about the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate was either a metal plate worn over a leather jerkin or a coat of chain mail or scales that protected the front and the back. And like a coat of chain mail would protect a soldier's vital organs, righteousness protects the hearts of believers. Look what the Bible says in verse 15. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The Roman legionaries wore heavy sandals, thick leather-soled sandals that would lace up with leather straps halfway up the calf that in cold weather they would stuff that with wool or cloth to keep them warm. And on the bottom of those thick-soled sandals would be spikes because these weren't running shoes. These were shoes to dig in and help you take your stand during battle. And the Bible says that the footwear for believers is the readiness of the gospel. Look at verse 16. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Whereas the previous pieces of armor are things that you wear, a shield is something you have to physically pick up. And the Roman shield was like an oblong shield, maybe four feet long and two and a half feet wide and protected most of the body in a concave shape with metal edges on the top and on the bottom, covered in calfskin with an iron boss right in the center. The iron boss would deflect arrows as they were flying in. And in this passage, it says that the shield is the thing that quenches the fiery darts of the evil one. So it's probably either talking about the seven foot long javelin that had a 33 yard kill range. And when it would stick in the shield, it would make it heavy and awkward to hold. So oftentimes the soldiers would abandon their shield, leaving themselves vulnerable to attacks. Sometimes those javelins would be dipped in pitch, lit on fire, and then thrown. It could be talking about the javelins, or it could be talking about regular arrows, where the heads of the arrows were dipped in pitch, lit on fire, and then shot. So the soldiers would often soak their shields uh, in water and cover them in wet calf skin before a battle to protect them from that fire. And this passage of scripture says, Our shield, the shield of believers who are in Christ, is faith, protecting us from the fiery darts of the evil one. Look what the Bible says in verse 17. 
and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. In warfare, the last two things a soldier would put on would be his helmet and his sword. Now, there were different shapes of Roman helmets, but basically they were metal helmets fastened to an iron skull cap that was lined with leather. They had a piece that would come down across the bridge of the nose to protect the nose and the eyes and a chin strap piece that would protect the face and oftentimes in the back it would protect the backs of their necks and around here as well. And here's why. Because a soldier could get a cut on the arm and continue fighting in battle. A soldier could even lose a finger and continue fighting in battle. But a blow to the head could be fatal, so the helmet was of the utmost importance. And this passage says that our salvation is our helmet that protects us from the lethal attacks of Satan. And finally, all the equipment we've talked about so far is defensive. But now the Bible shifts gears and talks about our offensive weapon. And that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Spanish sword was two inches wide by about two feet long, a short cut and thrust weapon to be used in close quarters that would be worn on the right thigh to stay out of the way of the left hand which bore the shield. It would be strapped to the thigh so it wouldn't get in the way of battle movement. And having a weapon in battle was of the utmost importance. And this passage of scripture tells us we have a weapon with which to fight Satan and with which to fight the forces of darkness. And that weapon is the Word of God. Primarily, every single week, we are reading through the book of Ephesians and memorizing our verses, not to get a prize, but primarily because this is what feeds us and teaches us how to live in Christ, but also this is our weapon to use against Satan and the forces of darkness. Look at verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And we also have a secret weapon. A secret weapon that taps into infinite power. And that secret weapon is prayer. Here's what prayer does. Prayer talks to the God who has unlimited power and asks God, who has unlimited power, to use that power on our behalf in the midst of this battle. It is the secret weapon of every believer. Ed sat in the lobby of the principal's office looking at his Bible, starting to well up with emotion. His mind went back to everything he had learned in the book of Ephesians, how it is an ancient letter written by Paul from house arrest in Rome, on a piece of papyrus, using a sharpened papyrus reed, writing to the believers in Ephesus who used to worship Artemis or Diana and practice the dark arts, but they don't anymore because they learned that salvation is a gift received only by repenting and believing on Jesus. And when someone repents and believes on Jesus, they become a brand new person to live a brand new life filled with good works. They are now in Christ to walk a new way, to take off the old, to put on the new. And it looks like a brand new life. It looks like not lying, but telling the truth. It looks like not stealing, but working so you can give to those in need. It looks like when you get angry, not sinning in anger. It looks like not speaking words that tear people down, but speaking words that build people up. It looks like walking in love, walking in light, and walking in wisdom. It makes every single relationship in your life different, including your relationship with your parents. And now, as he was looking at the final passage, Ed saw that God had given Ed everything he needs to live the Christian life. All that was left for him to do was take his stand. Ed stood to his feet, and one final time he closed his pocket Bible. He put it in his pocket. And Ed knew that this portion of the journey was over, but there was so much more to come. Ed knew that there was a battle ahead of him that would last the rest of his life. Ed wiped away a tear as he realized he doesn't have to do this battle alone. God has given him everything he needs to live the Christian life in Christ.
Guys, I hope you enjoyed this journey with Ed and with me. Do you understand? This is the end of the book of Ephesians, but this is the only the beginning of the battle. Satan wants to overthrow everything you have learned this year from the book of Ephesians. He wants to attack you. He wants you to sin. He wants you to live like you are not in Christ. But remember, God has given you everything you need to live the Christian life. So all there's left for you to do is take your stand. Our memory verse this week is Ephesians 6.10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And our final truth to live by is this. God has given me everything I need in Christ to live the Christian life. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming along on this journey with me. It's been incredible. It's been life-changing. I hope that you will never be the same. If you have not repented and believed on Jesus, you're not in Christ. You need to. And those of us who have, we're in Christ. We need to live a brand new life. So what are you waiting for? Let's get right to it.